Okay, if you would stand once more and turn to page 343. Stand as you sing, page 343. Revive us again. Page 343. Stand as you sing. We praise the O God. We're going to be singing in the till the storm passes by. In the dark of the midnight, have I all hid my face when the storm howls above me and there's no hiding place? With the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds will forever. Satan whispered 
is ended and the storms come no more. Let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore in that land where the tempest never comes. Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes. For those of you that don't know, 
Lee Watts has got a YouTube channel called Patriot Point. For those of you that learned that this morning, I highly recommend after the church services, the keyword is after the church services, get on your phone, get on YouTube and follow him. Why? Because it'll be a great encouragement to you with all the things that are going on, with all the things that the world is throwing at you, all those fiery darts we talked about knowing your adversary and some of the tools he uses, which is those fiery darts. We've got someone that's providing encouragement to God's people. I'd highly recommend it. Um, he is the author thereof. And uh, he, he, you spend quite a bit of time putting videos together for that particular channel, and thank God for it. I'm not going to take any more time, Brother Lee Watts. I'd like for you to go ahead and come on up and introduce yourself. And thank God that you're here, and I, I thank God for you, brother, very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. You're I very sure well. I appreciate that. Your pastor is one of these people who can preach and sing. I hate people like that. <laughs> uh, and your wife, too. That was just lovely. I take back all those nasty things I posted about you online. No. Um, well, uh, as Pastor said, my name is Brother uh, Watch His Name. That's a good way to remember. Um, I got my little table in the back. Uh, I hope that will be a blessing to you. Um, I got 10 different lessons. I'm sold out of some of them now that I think about it. I think there's four different cases left back there. Um, Pastor, you were talking before about how Jesus was talking uh, when his disciples had tried to cast out a devil. And they said, Lord, we weren't able to, but of course he did it. He said, this kind cometh uh, not out but by prayer and fasting. Uh, one of the things I want to point out there is that it's only the King James Version that says that. It says prayer and fasting. You get one of these modern versions, they leave fasting out. All right. In fact, that doctrine is left out almost entirely in the modern versions. One of the things back there is a, a blue book. It's called Weight in the Balances. Uh, when I was a kid, I, w I grew up in a church very similar to this one. And uh, my pastor said, use the King James Bible. My Christian school teacher said, use the King James Bible. My mom and dad said, use the King James Bible. Nobody ever said why, just because I said so. Now, because I said so works really well when you are a child. That does not work so well when you become an adult. So I became an adult, and I, I moved out of uh, the house, because that's what you're supposed to do when you grow up. <laughs> Uh, and I moved down to Tennessee, and I uh, found a job there, and I, I found a church. And the pastor said, hey, I use these new ones. Why do you only use the old King James? And the only answer I could give him was, well, that's what I was told that I believe. And that's really all I had. And so you know what he told me? He told me the same thing that I bet you have been told as well. How many people have heard these words? These new ones teach the same thing. They just use modern words. How many people have been told that? Well, I had a problem. I had my old pastor say, no, use the old book. I had my new pastor said the old book's good, but the new one's just as good. So I have two people who I believe both of them believe they are being honest with me. But they're telling me opposite things. So I said, well, by this time I had a big stack of the new different ones. And I said, I'm going to find out. So I started opening the books and I started seeing what do they actually teach. And I said, I grew up in Christian school and Christian home, and I know where the basic doctrines are. What do they say about salvation? What do they say about baptism side by side? What do they say about eternal security? What do they say about this? And I compare them side by side. And that's what that book is. It just is my little journey, and you can go on the journey as well. What do they actually say? And I print the verses side by side for the top 10 selling versions. And when I got done, you'll get a guess. I will be reading today out of the King James Bible. I found things which are different are not the same. And this thing that I was told, they just use modern words, is incorrect. And even though there'll be some good people who think they are telling you the truth, will tell you that, let's actually compare, and I think it'll be a little different. Uh, I'm Brother Lee Watts, and I approve this message. Okay. Uh, so uh, I usually don't do that. And I got a lot of, about other books and stuff back there. I hope that's a blessing for you. Just put the money in the box, and if you need change, come see me. Uh, but to the preaching hour, take your Bibles, please, today, and turn over to the book of Psalms, the last of the Psalms, Psalm number 150, and then uh, put a marker, please, over in 2 Chronicles chapter number 5, because uh, we'll reference that here briefly near the beginning as well. Now, I am an old-fashioned Baptist preacher. Uh, I enjoy a good amen, hallelujah, uh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, as long as it's in English, We'll get along just fine. Uh, if it's not, we might do a little Bible study real quick. Uh, it, it reminds me of this uh, one time. Uh, I heard this story back in the old western days. Out in the old west, there was this church, and the pastor passed away. So the deacon board gets together to find a new preacher, and they hire this young guy to be their new pastor out in the old west. And so the deacon gets the new preacher over, and he says, Now, preacher, we have the deacon board here in the west have decided to give you a gift. We're going to give you the old pastor's horse. And the young preacher said, well, much obliged. And the old deacon said, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, preacher. This has always been a Baptist preacher horse. 
So this horse will not start when it hears giddy up. This horse will only start when it hears the word praise the Lord. So the, de- so the preacher said, oh, I got it, I got it. And the deacon said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, preacher boy. He says, this is a Baptist preacher horse. So this horse doesn't stop when it hears woe. This horse only stops when it hears amen. So the preacher said, oh, I got it, I got it. Thank you, sir. So he thanks the deacon, he jumps on the horse, and he yells, praise the Lord. So the horse starts taking off. But while he's been talking to the deacon, storm clouds have come up. All of a sudden, there's a clap of thunder, a flash of lightning, and it spooks the horse. And the horse starts tearing off through the woods, and the branches are hitting the preacher, and the rain and the hail is coming down, and he's like, whoa, horse, whoa. But that's not the word. And then he remembers, wait a minute, the bridge is out, and this dumb horse is going to jump off the cliff and drown us both in the river. Oh, what was the word that deacon said? Uh, It was a Bible word. Uh, uh, Hallelujah, Uh, Mephibosheth. He can't think of the word. So the last thing he does, like all Baptists, is pray. He says, oh dear Lord, please make this horse stop before it jumps off the cliff and drowns us both in the river. Amen. And the horse heard amen. And so the horse stops right at the edge of the cliff. Young preacher Davis looks down and goes, whoo, praise the Lord. (laughs) So I enjoy a good amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Now if I say the words in conclusion, you all yell, amen. That's not what I'm talking about. All right. Uh, But we have here in the last of the Psalms, there's only six verses in this Psalm. And I think it's probably the most important thing the psalmist was trying to say. Because I learned that whenever you write a letter, you have your main point, then you really want to emphasize your last thing with your last words. So if you have found your place in the Scriptures, if you would stand please to honor the reading of God's perfect, preserved, inspired, infallible Word of God. Notice what the Bible says. It's only six verses, so we'll just read the whole chapter. Verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with a psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. I think I know the main point. I think we should be praising the Lord. I appreciate the nice words that you said about me, Pastor. But let us remember here today, all praise is to the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of mercy this morning. I thank you, Father, it is known as a throne of mercy and not of judgment. Though we know, Father, judgment is coming one day. Father, we are in the need of people who are in desperate need of mercy. We're in desperate need of grace, though we are undeserving. Father, the one who is deserving, Father, we come to you in his name. I ask, Father, is anyone here today who is not knowing you as their Father, then may they be under conviction, and may the Holy Spirit bring conversion. I ask you, Father, if there's any distractions, that you would drive them from our minds, there's any evil spirits that would try to take away from the presentation of your work, then, Father, by the blood and name of Jesus Christ, we ask you to bind them and you keep them far from this place. May Christ be exalted, the Holy Spirit be free to do His work and all these things, Father, we ask in Jesus' precious, powerful, and holy name. Amen. amen. And amen. Thank you. And please be seated. They told me in Bible college you've got to give all your sermons a title. So I get this one from the last verse there. It says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So this one's called either praise the Lord or hold your breath, take your pick. <laughs> now, I, again, I told you I grew up in a church very similar to this. I went to a Christian school when I was a boy. My grandfather was a Baptist preacher. My uncle was a Baptist preacher. My mom played the piano. We went to every single service. We'd be there Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. we go to every meeting of every revival, every jubilee, every missions conference. If there was a singing, we'd drive by on a Tuesday just to see if something was going on at church. I went to Christian school. We'd have chapel. I went to the college. And when I added it up as I was preparing this sermon, I have literally been to tens of thousands of church services. And in all of that, I can count on my hands how many times, like the old folks say, it broke out. And that's those services where you can just feel God. 
and they can last all. I was in one, uh, actually was in Maryville Baptist Church, that church that refused to close that the governor sent the troopers after. I was in one there about three years ago there. We had a three, four hour meeting and the preacher never even preached. Because you know what? I was thinking about every one of those services where it broke out. And it wasn't because the preacher was just really plugged in and God was using him. And those times are great and praise the Lord for him. But the times I'm thinking about where it broke out, as we say, is before the preacher gets up. It's because the people get up there and they started singing about how good God is. And this particular service I was thinking about over in Maryville, they sang some songs about how great the Lord is. And then somebody said after a song, hey, I want to give a testimony. And they just started bragging on what the Lord had done for them. And the preacher said, well, sing another one. And they said another one about the goodness of God. And then afterwards, somebody else said, well, I want to brag on the Lord too. And they just said how the Lord had moved in their life. And then they sung another one and they testified and people came down and they started getting right with God and hearts were broken and they get right with each other. And we had a three, four hour meeting and the preacher never even preached. I know because I was supposed to be the preacher. And you got all those people there and the preacher's like, hey, are you upset? I was like, no, 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 you don't want to get in front of what God's doing. And I thought back to every one of the services I've ever been in like that, every single time, it's because God's people started praising God for what he's doing. You know what, that's why the devils don't like the song service time. And the devils love it when you don't participate in the song service time. Or you get your song book and you'll be like... Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Devils love that. You know what the Bible says? It says the devil right now is not in hell. A lot of people think the devil's coming out of hell. No, it says the devil is actually before the throne of God, accusing the brethren night and day. And you know what he does when we do things like that? He's like, hey, look at them down over there in where am I at? E-Town. Hey, look at them in there at E-Town. Do you think they're really thinking about what they're saying? Do you think they're really praising you? Accusing us of just going through the motions. Devils hate praising the Lord. And you notice I call them devils. I don't call them demons. The word demon is nowhere in your King James Bible. Did you realize that? It's not in there at all. This is a very recent word in human history. And if you work up, look up demon in the dictionary, you know what the definition is? A tutelary spirit. One who tutors to guide. And we got a whole lot of people that are relying on the spirits to guide them instead of what this word says right here. And there is nothing that the Holy Spirit will ever guide you to do that contradicts what is in this book. So I like to use Bible terms. I like to use that word devils instead of the word demons. Don't get me wrong. I don't think you're wicked if you don't. uh, But that's just personally why I do that there. Now let's think about this. Take, I told you to uh, keep your marker there in Psalm. Turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter number 5. Here we have just seen the temple that has first been built, the temple that Solomon uh, had overseen the construction of. They're dedicating that. And then notice what it says in chapter number 5 in verses 13 through 14. It says, And it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. Think about that. This is not confusion. And that's what we see in a lot of these charismatic movements. We see everybody kind of off doing their own thing. And if somebody were to come in, as Paul said, that's just confusion. These people are moving as one. It is done decently and in order. And they're singing and they're praising God. So notice what it says. They're singing and praising the Lord, uh, uh, praising the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever, that, them, that then the house was filled with cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. When did God show up? When they started praising the Lord. You know what? The devils, they don't like that and they'll get out. But the Lord will show up when you start praising the Lord with a genuine heart. And then you notice this was, first of all, the people were there in the temple. But you know what? The cloud wasn't able to fill the house of the Lord till all the flesh got out. You know what? We've got to empty ourselves of self and of our flesh in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Trouble is, we like just, just a little portion of the Holy Spirit. And be like, well, this is good, and we got to keep that flesh in there. If we empty ourselves, you get that pride out, you get that flesh out, you know what's going to happen? Then the Holy Spirit can fill us. And the Holy Spirit's job is to point to the Son. And you know what the Son does? The Son points to the Father. And the Father says, you need to pay attention to the Holy Spirit. Whew. 
It's going to get good Amen. when we empty ourselves and we start praising Praise the Lord. Lord. I like that word, hallelujah. You know, I go to a lot of Baptist churches and you'll hear a lot of amens. All right, I like amen. Amen means so be it. It means I, I agree with whatever was just said. And if the preacher's preaching on your sin and you can't say oh man, uh, amen because your wife will nudge you, just say oh me, all right, amen, <laughs> oh me, either one. But you know what, that word hallelujah, that's a good word to say as well. Hallelujah, actually, if you were to read uh, back in uh, Psalm, I mean, uh, the Psalms, which is our key chapter there, chapter 150, when it says, praise ye the Lord, if you were to read that in the original Hebrew, that is the word, hallelujah. That means, praise ye Yah. Yah being the Old Testament name of God the Father. And so when we say, hallelujah, we're saying, praise ye the Lord. That's why I don't like it when I see some of these wicked people in some of their uh, contemporary songs and they'll use the word hallelujah. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. That's why I was very happy today when we were singing uh, Revive Us again. That's great. I want to notice again what it says there in uh, particularly verse 3. It says, All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain who has borne all our sins and cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. I think the author of that song had read Psalm chapter number 150. Hallelujah. He's like, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you think about it, back over in there in the book of Isaiah, it says Isaiah was granted a vision of the Lord. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. And it talks about these seraphims up there. See, there's different types of angelic beings. And one of those is called a seraphim. And two of these guys' jobs, their job all day long is just to fly around the throne of the Lord. And it says that one of them just kept saying, Hallelujah! 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 And he'd just say, Holy! 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 And now you would think an angel would be able to have a better vocabulary than to just keep saying, holy, holy, holy. So I know what that other seraphim's thinking. He's like, well, I can outdo this. And when he thought about the Lord, you know what he said? He's like, holy, holy, holy. That's all he can think to say too. Holy God. Holy God. And we sit here sometimes. I'll tell you what's sad is when preachers will ask, anybody got a word of testimony? And nothing happens. That's not the way it ought to be. I remember when I was a kid, um, there was this TV show and it was called Welcome Back, Cotter. And if you didn't grow up in the 70s, you missed some very good television. All right. <laughs> Uh, Welcome back, Cotter. It's about the school teacher, Mr. Cotter, or Cotter, as they'll call him. And he had the worst group of students you'd ever want to have in a class. And the worst of all of them was this kid named Horshack. And whenever Mr. Cotter would ask a question, everybody else, Bobby and all of them watching, they were too cool to answer the question. Except Horshack, he'd say, Oh, me, Mr. Cotter, call me, call me, oh, call me, Mr. Cotter, I know the answer, call me. <laughs> Preacher gets up, he says, Anybody got a word of praise for the Lord? You know what the church ought to be full of? Mr. 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 Richard, call me. I want to praise the Lord. Oh, please call me. I want to share everybody how good God's been to me. Well, that's not what happens. Everybody's Bobby Viverino and Washington and the others, and there's crickets. These things ought not be so. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you've got to act like Horseshack and act like a fool. I don't think the Lord's within 50 feet of that either. But you know what? Somebody can say, you know what? I just want to say, God's been good to me this week. And you know when I can tell somebody's really doing it in the spirit, not in the flesh? When they get up and they can't even speak. And they're thinking about how God has worked in their heart. That's what the Bible means when it says, in uh, in mutterings which cannot be uttered. That's not talking about tongues. That's just, I can't even speak it because I'm just overcome with my emotion and my gratitude. That's the way that these things ought to be. Notice what it says there in verse number one. It says, praise God in his sanctuary. Do you know what we call this room here in the church building? The sanctuary. All right. We ought to see amens, praise the Lord, hallelujahs. And yet so often, I remember I was at this church one time and I was just doing Sunday school. I wasn't preaching. So I taught Sunday school, sat there for the preaching service. And the preacher said something about the blood. I said, amen. Everybody stopped, even the preacher. And they're like, because they weren't used to that. And then later I, he did something else and it was good. I said, well, praise the Lord. And people were again just like, can he do that? Is that legal? <laughs> and then you know what happened after a while? There's somebody, some old deacon over there after a while. I said, amen. He's like, well, amen. <laughs> 
And by the end of it, I, there's a few more saying, you know what, amen, because you realize not everybody's at the same spiritually maturity level that you are. I, again, I, I am the guest preacher today. I've never been here before. I have no idea who is a deacon and who is a visitor. I, I don't know in, that today. So if we come up, and, and that's the same way every single week you might have visitors here or, or people who come a few times and they have very little Bible training. And when the preacher says something that we're like, you know what, that's the truth. That's what we stand for. By saying amen, it not only encourages the preacher, say no, keep on it, brother. You know what that tells a visitor? Be like, that's something that we believe here. That's the reason I like that it still says Baptist on the sign. I like when I drive down the street and I see something that says Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic on the side. You know why? Because when I see that, I know, I know where they stand on the issues. Yeah. But when they take those things off, we're like, well, we just might stand anywhere. At least I, I have more respect for somebody on the other side of an issue than somebody who tries to ride the fence and be on yeah. both things. Yeah. Right. I have more respect for my enemy than the guy who won't even tell me where he's at. Yeah. So you know what? Whenever they say something true, it's good to say amen. That's what we believe here. Amen. All right? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's keep going on. Uh, in Psalm number 18, in verse number 3, it says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Why do we praise God? Because He's worthy to be praised. Not because necessarily something good happened to me. I just praise God just because He's worthy of all praise. Whether anything good happened to me or not, I can still stand up and I can say, Holy, holy, holy. And I can say, you know what? God died for me. And this is the worst it's ever going to get because I've got eternity to look forward to. There is always a reason to praise the Lord. I remember uh, my little girl Hannah, uh, when she was having a birthday, she was, I don't know, probably turning 11 or 12. Uh, I said, all right, Hannah, what do you want for your birthday? And she says, Dad, I want to go to a monster truck rally. <laughs> do I look like a monster truck rally kind of guy? <laughs> My little girl wants to go to Monster Truck Rally. I'm going to find me a Monster Truck Rally. Well, we live in Lexington, and I looked, and sure enough, there was going to be one in just a few weeks over at Rupp Arena, which is like 10 minutes from our house. And so I got us some tickets, and I took my little Hanny, and we go to the Monster Truck Rally. In, you know, it's in Rupp Arena. It's just a basketball court. Now, usually these things are held outside in these great big fields and all this kind of stuff. But this is inside a basketball arena. Remember that. And they, they said bring hearing protection because it's so loud, and you're inside that closed-in space. And they were right. When the trucks came out, it was so loud, it vibrates your bones from the sound waves. And uh, so the people came, the, the trucks came out, and the people went crazy. They're like, woo, isn't that something? And so they had this big mound of dirt that's probably about as high as this communion table. And so now usually they'll have a great big one, and they'll run, and they'll woo, and they'll jump over that, and then they'll land and bounce. But all they can do is they go from the free throw line up to the center court so they can get up to about seven, eight miles an hour. So they just go, boop, and they just drive over it. And you know what the people did? The people went, woo, isn't that something? <laughs> And then, you know, they run over the old cars and they smush them down. Well, they had about eight or nine of those big trucks. And they could only fit in one car because uh, the trucks took up the rest of the space. So after the second monster truck drove over it, my little Chevy Cruze would drive over that thing. And the people went crazy. Oh, isn't that great? And if there was, there was a guy in front of me, if he was a day, he was 75. I think he had his grandson with him, a young kid. He said, now, boy, that's something worth doing in your life. And the people hooped and they hollered. And when they left and we walked out, their voices were like this because they had yelled for their favorite truck so much. I liked the one that looked like a big shaggy dog, had ears and everything on it. That was a Saturday night. I would have loved to have gone to church with some of those people the next morning. They're like, well, I don't like to display my emotions in public. Baloney. I don't buy that any more than I did that Joe Biden won. <laughs> they just don't like to praise the Lord. But you get talking about your favorite sports team when that's going on, oh, you'll just play your emotions in. For me, I don't care about sports whatsoever, but you get election night on, oh, I'll just play my emotions in. I think, that, you know what, it's okay. Don't try to work it up, though. The Lord's not impressed with that. You try to work it up, the emotion, God's not within 50 feet of that. I believe he is displeased. And I see that sometimes where somebody will be called on to pray and they're, they're just sitting there having a conversation and all of a sudden, oh Lord, as if they're in the middle of great tears when a half a second ago they were fine. God's not within 50 feet of that. God doesn't look on the outward. He looks on the inward. And I think that a lot of us are going to have to answer for being in the flesh when we did our prayers. 
Because just because we say a prayer doesn't mean that the Lord is always hearing that. Over in the book of Acts, chapter number 5, verse 22, it says, Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. He's like, listen, you are offering me sacrifice, but you are in wickedness, you're in the flesh, I'm not going to accept that. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 8, it says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Amen. So you know what? A lot of people think, well, I'm just going to go out and they live like the devil throughout the week and then want to come in God's house and say, well, praise the Lord. God's not going to accept that praise. Uh, I remember when I was in the service, I was in the military, I was stationed over in South Carolina. And uh, we had a pastor and he was... At that time, this has been 15 years ago, and he was in his 80s then. He's, he's probably passed away by now. But he told a story that when he was a little boy, he grew up way out in the county there in South Carolina, just farm community in the 1930s. And he said, now when I was a boy back in the 20s and 30s, he's like, there was nothing to do. There was no TV. He said, a lot of people didn't even have radio back then. So the most fun, th you're not like, you know what's going on. All right. <laughs> He said, so what we would really like to do on Halloween night, the fun thing to do for all us boys was to go around and push over people's outhouses. And we thought that was the most fun ever. Well, old Farmer Brown, we'll call him. Uh, I forget who it was in the story. Farmer Brown, he got tired of every November the 1st having to reset up his outhouse. So on October the 31st, before the sun went down, he picked his outhouse up and he moves it five feet to the left. <clears throat> Puts it down. Well, of course, there's no streetlights out 1930 in the middle of the county out there. Well, little Johnny, he's probably, oh, he said about eight, nine years old. And, of course, it gets real dark that time of year. It's probably only 5, 36 o'clock or something like that. He says, they've been out pushing over out houses. They get Farmer Browns. And they're like, Johnny, this guy, he gets more aggravated than anybody else in the county. Johnny, you can go do this one yourself. He's like, all right, fellas. And he goes running and he goes, whoop. He says, and it went over my head, and my mouth was open. He says, I come up yelling, help me, help me, and all my friends were gone. He said, so I try to climb out. Have you ever tried to uh, dig a hole, and there's, it gets wet, and you get garden hose in there, and, the, and the, the ground clumps in on you? He says, I try to climb out, and the ground would just clump in. He says, I down there about three hours. He says, it's cold. Have you ever been in an amusement park in the summertime and you get on the water ride and then after that you're like, ooh, you know, you're kind of cold from the water ride and that's in the summertime. This is a little eight, eight, nine year old kid in the, October 31st and he's been in this stuff for three hours. He says, I didn't think I was getting out. He's like, but finally I clawed my way out of that thing and he started the long walk home. Now, I lived in the kind of neighborhood when I grew up in the 70s, uh, the kind of neighborhood, if you did something wrong and the neighbors knew, they called and there was a beating waiting on you when you got home. <laughs> Little Johnny lived in the same kind of neighborhood because old Farmer Brown, he found out, he didn't help the kid out either. And he called daddy. So little Johnny, he's so cold and shaking and he stinks. And he finally gets home and his daddy's outside to meet him. He's like, oh, daddy, daddy, I'm so cold. You won't believe what happened to me tonight. He says, boy, you're not coming in the house with that stuff all over you. <laughs> Strip. He's like, daddy, but it's outside. He's like, you're not bringing that into mama's house. Strip. So he stripped down just in his birthday suit right there. He says, can I come in now, Dad? He says, you still got it all over you. So he turns around and he turns on the garden hose. You ever felt garden hose water October 31st? <laughs> it's cold. So he's like, Psh, turn around, boy, turn around. He's like, oh. So he's cold, he's chafed, he's afraid. He's like, Daddy, will you hug me and let me come inside now? He's like, then Dad didn't let me come inside and he wore me up right good. And you should all know what I mean by that. Now, the reason that he related that story, what really happened to him, is the reason I relate it to you now. We go out in this world. You know what the Bible says our righteousness is? Filthy rags. You try to wipe that boy down with a rag, you know what we've done? You call that a filthy rag. When somebody wrongs me, and I say I love you because Christ loved me, when somebody offends you and you go out of your way to be a blessing to them, God says, that's good. That's righteousness. That's being Christ-like. 
and your righteousness compared to me is filthy rags. And we want to go out and enjoy the sins and the pleasures and the filth of this world, which is far worse than our righteousness. And then we want to come into God's house and say, Lord, will you just hug on me for a while? Can I just hug on you, Father? I got a hurt. Father, I got a burden. I got a request. And you're like, how come I can't feel the closeness to the Lord? How come I can't hear his voice? You know why? He's like, you're not coming into my presence and you're not getting close to hug on me with that stuff all over you. We want to start praising the Lord. You know what we've got to do first? We've got to get clean. You don't have to come down to this altar. There's no magic down here. But I sure have been able to do a lot more serious business with God here than I did right there. How many times you've been praying and you're going over whatever you're praying about that day and then you find yourself thinking about, oh, I've got to make sure to add this to the grocery list. Uh, I've I got to make sure to take care of this. And our mind wanders. You know, I think that's one of the reasons why the altar is a good place to focus. That's one of the reasons why I think the devil was all about cancel church, tell people they can just watch online. You know how many distractions there are when you're sitting on your couch watching the service? You maybe got your phone going, you're watching on TV or whatever else, something else going on in the house. But you're in the church house a lot more focused. Amen. And the Holy Spirit moves a lot more. Amen. We praise God because He is worthy. We praise God because we are in the good times. People may say, things are bad right now. And while they are compared to what we had before, we still, even today, are better than almost everybody else on the entire planet and in all of human history. Even the way that we think things are rotten right now, which I don't think that they're good, I think they are pretty rotten right now. We still live better. We can say, you know what, praise God, I live here and I live in this time. I remember when I was in the service, they stationed me over in Kosovo. Kosovo was getting ready to declare independence from Serbia. And so they pre-positioned a bunch of international troops so the Serbs wouldn't invade when they declared independence. So they sent me over there and they said, all right, Sergeant Watts, well, you're here in Kosovo. Your job is to look for smugglers. I said, oh, smugglers? I've, I've always wanted to shoot a drug smuggler. This is great. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 not, not drug smugglers. I'm like, uh, weapon smugglers. That might be a little dangerous to shoot at them, but I'll shoot them. They're like, no, no, not weapon smugglers. I said, uh, human trafficking smugglers. Oh, I'll shoot those guys. They're dirt. And they're like, no, no, not human trafficking smugglers. I said, well, what kind of smugglers am I looking for? What are these people smuggling? They're like, oh, the people are smuggling um, firewood. I said the same thing you probably just said, firewood. See, Kosovo used to be part of the communist regime, the communist empire the Russians had. During the 70 years that they oppressed that country, they cut down literally every tree in the country. And the biggest trees there are little sprigs, probably not much bigger than this because they're trying to regrow it. So what these people do to heat their homes is they will sneak across the border to the neighboring countries. They'll cut down a tree and then they'll sneak across the border. They'll use that to heat their home for a few days or trade that to somebody else to try to get food to live on for them and their family for a few days. And it is my responsibility to make sure that borders are secure because the neighboring countries are like, hey, they're robbing us. This is our resource. And it's my job to hunt these people down. I'm like, ugh. Well, praise the Lord. We went out, me and two other fellas, and we never saw anybody. So I didn't have to worry about having that on my conscience. But during our patrols, one day we went through this little bitty village. And um, this is very late in the year, probably about this time of year. And this is in the Balkan Mountain region. And this is a, it, it's, a, it's a lot colder there than it is here in Kentucky in December. We're talking freezing or below every single day. All right, we're in the mountains. Well, as we're driving through, you can see through people's houses uh, because they just use Stone Age technology. They will pile rocks up and use mud for the mortar between the rocks. And when the mud falls away, you can see through the, the house and through the back wall too. We one time had dinner in the president of Kosovo's home. Today, this building is nicer than his house. You have more money in your pocket today than probably he has in his bank account. I mean, this is a country that was described as without an economy. They have nothing. Well, as we're driving through this one day, uh, we're in the Humvee, some kids start following behind the vehicle. And they're probably about, oh, nine, ten years old. And I said, well, I guess they don't see a lot of vehicles, especially military ones. 
And they said, no, no, that's not it, Sergeant Watts. See, the trouble is they want us to pull over and give them something to eat because they're hungry. Now, these little kids are skinny. We got some kids here that, you know what, they're healthy. They're thin, but you know what, that's a good healthy size for them. These little kids, no, no nothing like that. Pronounced cheekbones because there's no little fat on those cheeks. Half of them don't have coats. Few of them don't have shoes. It's below freezing, but it's not any warmer in the house. In fact, in the house, you don't even get the sunlight. And so I said, oh, man, and it started tearing at my heart. That morning before we left, we'd had a nice meal over at the chow hall, and they set a sign up. They said, tonight when you guys get back, we're having uh, burritos. And I had a little meal with me. Anybody, we got any veterans in the room today? All right, we got one back there. You know what I say when I say MRE? It's a little bag they give you. It's called Meal Ready to Eat. It's full of calories, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I, I'm, I got a full belly from breakfast. I got burritos waiting on me for dinner. And I got a lunch MRE in my lap. And I said, hey, hey, pull over. I'm going to give my MRE. And the driver of the Humvee says, no, I can't do that, Sergeant Watts. See, if you get out, these kids will mob you and every adult from around here will start mobbing you and they'll start trying to take from you your boots to stay warm, your clothes, and your very life will be in jeopardy and I'll have to shoot people to save your life. He says, you want to give them your lunch? Fine, I'll slow down. You can open the door and you can toss it out to them. I said, all right, do that. Now, inside of the MRE bag, there's a lot of little individual bags. Uh, there's one for the meat and one for the vegetable and stuff like that. I pull out the first one. It says meat slice. It doesn't even say what kind of meat. Now, we as Americans, when we get that one, we make fun of that because they're like, it doesn't even tell you what kind of meat it is. Meat in Kosovo is gold. So I take that first one and I toss out that first package. And it's the bigger boys who are, uh, go faster and they get in it and they get it and they start fist fighting for all they got for this little hunk of mystery meat. And I get to the next one, green beans, which most of us, to be honest, we'd probably throw away. I throw it out, they just send on it. I get a little package, it's just four crackers. I toss it out, they're clawing and scratching. That's food, that's food, I gotta have it. And I get to the last little thing I've got left. By now, most of the bigger kids are fighting, and we got the younger guys who are still chasing after. And I remember there was a little boy and he had a threadbare Mickey Mouse t-shirt. I'm guessing somebody in the States, their kids had all worn that, They'd washed it a million times. It got so threadbare. Instead of throwing it out, they donated it to charity to feel good. And this little kid in Kosovo had that no coat, below freezing, threadbare little T-shirt, and I tass out that last thing. Well, that little fella, he gets there first, and he grabs it. And he's so happy, and he's trying to work the plastic to get it open. He gets the plastic open, and one of the bigger boys shows up, grabs it, and shoves it in his mouth real quick to eat it. And I saw that little fella still on his knees. And he started weeping and shaking from his sobs. I had food in my hand. I had food. I could live another few days and I wasn't fast enough. I wasn't strong enough. And you know what we do as Americans? Before they close the restaurant, you go to Cracker Barrel, KFC, and you have a big mound of food. We say, dear Lord, thank you for this food. Please bless everybody I know. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's eat. Praise God that you live in the good times. I've had to send my kids to bed a few times, but I've never had to listen to them fall asleep crying because they're hungry. Thank you, God. Our biggest concern when we get home, you open up the fridge, is man, we've got to make sure to eat all this stuff before it goes bad. Praise God that you live here at this time. Praise God in the good times. Praise God because He's worthy. And third and finally, praise God in the bad times. I think the Lord is pleased when we come together and we celebrate like Thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for. Uh, and I think God is pleased when He says, look how thankful and grateful that the people are on how I have blessed them. But you know what? When your heart is broken or when you have without and you come and you praise God in your need, and in your hurt, I think God is so much more pleased with that. I bet he says, hey, Gabriel, Gabriel, come here, come here a minute. 
It's like you smell that. Because it says that our prayers come before the Lord like incense poured on an altar. He's like, you smell that? Oh, that's a sweet savor. Get a bottle. I want to save this. The Bible says that he'll pour out the tears of the saints. Realize he keeps our tears because they're precious to him. How many tears have you shed in praising the Lord? I think we have too many dry eyes in our churches. It's been too many years where nobody shed a tear for their fellow man, for the gratefulness they have of the Lord saving their old wretched soul. And when you get ground that hasn't had moisture for a long time, it gets dry, it gets cracked, and you can't do a thing with it. Nothing's going to grow in that. But if you add some water, it makes it malleable. You can now use that. You know what? Life can now grow. I lost my mother about a year and a half ago. Mom had always played piano in church every Sunday that I was alive. They'd sing and then my mom would sing a special. She was known for having a great voice, recorded several songs. And she was known for always being a very beautiful woman. Long, flowing, blonde hair. Mom was very attractive. Well, then mom got this lung disease. Well, you know you got little sacks in your lungs? Well, hers wouldn't stretch and open anymore. They would turn hard like cement. And so she couldn't catch her breath. And they couldn't do anything about that. And so it got to a point where she's like, I can't sing a special, I can't sing in the choir anymore because I can't get a breath to sing. And oh, how that broke my mother's heart. And then she got a point where it was hard to walk around because she's like... <laughs> just to walk around, and she got to a point where she wasn't allowed to go to church. She couldn't go to the store because it was too much effort, and she would wear herself out. And then she got to a point where she couldn't walk around the house because every little step was so much effort that she'd almost pass out from oxygen deprivation. And then she got bedridden. And we all knew this is mom's last few days. It was getting ready to be Mother's Day. And I knew it was her last one. She knew it. My dad knew it. We all did. So I drove down to where they live. They retired and moved down to Georgia. So I went down to see my mother for her last Mother's Day. They'd shaved her head because since she wasn't able to get up and to wash herself, they said the best thing for hygiene then, instead of having the dirty hair, is just to shave the head. And she got to the point where she couldn't eat anymore because to take time to chew or to swallow, she'd almost pass out because no, there wasn't any air in there to begin with. And my mother was down to 82 pounds. I walk into that bedroom and my dad said, son, you just steady yourself. My little mother's shaved head, literally starving to death and gasping for air like a drowning person. And I said, Happy Mother's Day, Mom. How are you? And she nudged me forward close so I could get down to her ear and hear her say, She says, Lee, it is well. Starving to death, drying on, drowning on dry land, and she says, It is well. You know why somebody can do that? Because they're like, death has no fear for me. My God's been so good to me all these years. My heart's at peace. It is well. If you've ever sung that song in church, the pastor's probably told you the story. It was written, that song, it is well, because a guy had lost all of his daughters and drowned in the sea in a boat accident. So he got on a boat and he came across the sea and he asked the captain, when we get to that spot where my little girl's drowned, let me know. And the captain said, sir, this is the spot where that other ship went down. And that's where he wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And when you have great heartache and when you have something that's not right and you take time in prayer and the tears fall and you say, Lord, I'm hurting. I'm threatened. But it is well because of what you've done. Thank you, Lord. He says, collect those tears. That meant a lot more to the Jews who were told that. Because do you realize that at a Jewish funeral, 
the children of whoever has passed away will come around and they reach inside the casket. Because Jewish custom is they got these little vials, little bottles. And whenever you're praying over your children and you weep, you take that bottle and you catch those tears in that little bottle. And when the kids come on that last day, they say, look how many times that dad wept over us with all these tears. And that's very precious to them. And our tears are very precious to our Heavenly Father. You praise God because He's worthy. You praise God in the good times and you praise God in the bad times. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Father, we love you, Lord. As Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips who dwells among a people of unclean lips. Father, we are not worthy, but I thank you. You loved us anyway. I ask you, Father, to forgive me and forgive us collectively for how we have neglected you, for how we have been ungrateful for what you have done. I ask you, Father, now that you would work in hearts and lives during this invitation time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to respond, we're going to be in page 306. Pastor.